Okay, our scripture reading today is Esther 3, verses 1 to 4. So it's Esther chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And it says, On the seventh month it came that the Israelites had settled in their town, and the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, the son of Zodadak, and his fellow priest from Zerubbabel, son of uh, Shiltel, and his associates began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offering on it in accordance with what had been written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar on the foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifice. Today we're going to have our sermon brought to us by Pastor Willis. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. It is a privilege to be in the house of God today, to be amongst you. I can remember um, 2007. Uh, was the first uh, year I came through these doors. And from the first uh, time that I walked through these doors, I felt at home and uh, felt love, Pastor Shepard. Uh, so I want to thank your current pastor, my former president, Elder Davis, and uh, those that are here today. It is a privilege to be in your midst to share a word of the Lord. This is a time when we need the Lord more than ever before. Would you say amen? This is a time where we need to reemphasize the truth of the Word of God more than ever before. I have to share a little bit of my experience uh, real quick. I um, recently was selected for promotion to uh, Fulberg Colonel in the Army uh, Reserves, and it's been a long journey. It's been 25 years. In 1996, March 28th, I swore in um, as a serviceman, and I received a hug from the colonel that swore me in that day and said, welcome to the Brotherhood, and it's truly been a long journey. I can tell you that I never planned on um, arriving at this rank. That wasn't my goal, Elder Davis. My goal was to have a job. How about that? <laughs> my, my goal was to have a job. And really, there's a story and a lesson in there for all young people who just don't know where they're going and what they're going to do with their life. All I have to say on that is stay focused. Amen. Listen to somebody above you and don't quit. How about that? If you stay focused and you listen and you don't quit, you just might make it all the way to the top. Somebody ought to say amen. I'm a witness of what God can do. You sang that song this morning. You were there. God was there along the journey. Two tours in Iraq, and you guys saw me coming in between those tours. Who, who is this guy coming in? I was coming in, battle beaten, battle bruised. I came here, felt at home, and I was blessed, and I know you all have appreciated your love that you share, and me as a visitor. I'm a witness of what family and friendship can do. God is good. This is a family friendly church and we thank you for your love throughout the years. I just want to share a brief word with you this morning that the Lord gave us in Esther chapter 3 and I'm going to read it in your hearing. But before we begin, we want to talk on the subject living without compromise. Living without compromise. Let us pray. Father, this morning we await your words. We ask that you would speak to our hearts. Shut up the noise of the ordinary, the run of the mill, and allow us to see Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember when I was um, matriculating through school, uh, my father was moved to Champaign, Illinois, and we could not go to the Adventist school there. There was something going on. The school was small, and something happened. We weren't able to attend, and we went to a public school there in, in the city of Champaign, and I believe it was Kenwood Elementary School, and I remember there were some assignments that we were asked to do um, on the weekend. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't come to the school Friday night or whatever the case. And they said, well, why can't you do it? Everybody else is doing it. Why can't you? 
And the best thing that I could come up with as a young uh, 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 Seventh-day Adventist in the fourth grade, the best thing that I could come up with was because of my religion, I can't attend. And that used to be a thing. I, I recall that young people used to say, because of my religion, and, and sort of had a wrong tone to it, but it was the best thing that I could come up with. And I will tell you that it, it is still relevant today that because of our religion, there are some things that we can't do. Because of our religion, there's some boundaries that we can't cross or that we shouldn't cross. How about that? I wish some of the young people today would have that quote on in their vocabulary where they could stand up and say, because of my religion. I don't know if they know that well what their religion really is. And where the boundaries are, because the boundaries have been getting pushed and pushed to the side for many, many years. But I'm here to encourage you today that the word of the Lord still has boundaries. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to know Job refused to let go of God in the midst of overwhelming personal loss where boundaries could have been crossed. Job held on. Daniel insisted on praying three times a day. Even those, those people were against him. Daniel stood at the window, kneeled at the window and continued to pray because of his religion. Joseph came into a land and he did not compromise his beliefs because because of his religion. Mordecai would not kneel nor pay homage and honor a man because of his religion. What about you today, friends? Do you have a religion? Do you have a faith that is so strong that you can stand up and tell your boss because of my religion? Esther chapter 3, let's go there quickly and read verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, after these things, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Amittiah, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All of the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman. For the king had commanded this concerning him. Watch this. But Mordecai, the Bible says, would not kneel down or pay honor to him. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. Bible says here, for he told them he was a Jew. It was because of his religion. <laughs> it was because of his beliefs. It was because he had boundaries that he could not do certain things. The other day, Elder Davis, I was asked to do a wedding. I love weddings. I would love to present at the wedding I was asked to do. I kind of got excited in a COVID environment. How are we going to do this? Just the two of us. Okay, that's great. Let me ask you, what are your beliefs? Where do you stand? We got to talk about this. I'm excited about doing your wedding. He said, well, one is an Adventist and the one is not. I said, oh, Lord, how, well, well, how, 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 how are we going to do this? What are we going to, how are we going to work this out? And I, and I had to say, I listen, I'd love to do your wedding, but I have a confession to make. I am a full seven-day Adventist minister. And because of my religion, because of my beliefs, because of the boundaries, because of the ecclesiastical endorsement that I have, there are certain things I cannot do. I would love to serve you, but I cannot perform your ceremony because of what we believe as Adventists. Oh, pastor, we understand. I said, listen. Now, what I will do for you, I will refer you to someone else. And if you go to somebody else and you decide to get married anyway, I'll be there on the other side to nurture you spiritually and help you be guided in the way God would have you go. 
Ladies and gentlemen, today it is a rough time, and I know that's not a popular message for many, but the reality is we have beliefs that we stand on that, is, that, w that have requirements that we ought to follow. There are some boundaries. We are not like the rest of the world, and engaging in situations like the rest of the world puts us at risk of being outside of our religion. Mordecai wouldn't do it because he was a Jew. When it comes to religion, everybody has something they believe in, even if it's absence of God. You can have a religion that is absent of God. Some people go to church and are absence of God's presence. Atheists and those who practice meditation alone and mindfulness alone outside of godliness and Buddhism and other religions without God. In his highly entertaining book, The Seven Steps, The Seven Types of Atheism, released in October in the U.S., philosopher John Gray puts it this way, religion is an attempt to find meaning in events, not a theory that tries to explain the universe. It exists because we humans are the only species so far as we can know who have evolved to know explicitly that one day in the future we will die. This is why science can't replace religion. Science does not tell you how to live. Philosophers have sought to find the answer on how to live and they came up with ethics. But I want you to tell, tell you today that only religion, amen, in the true sense of the word, can give purpose and meaning to your life. Religion helps you figure out what you are going to do with your life and what you're not going to do. Can I tell you a story? I was in Kuwait driving to a base, and uh, my assistant was driving, and I had a young man we were taking to. Uh, um, Arif John was a big base in Kuwait. And we were taking him there, and we began to have a conversation. It was about an hour and a half, and there was nothing there but desert in the road. So we had nothing to do but talk. And I said, well, what do you believe? And he began to tell me what he believes. And I said, what's your religion? What's your religious preference? He said, I believe in hedonism. I said, what? He said, yeah, chaplain, I used to be a Christian, but I wanted to pick something where I wouldn't feel guilty doing whatever I wanted to do. Do you know, but there are Adventists and Christians, so-called Christians, who don't feel guilty doing whatever they want to do? At least he had the common sense to say, I'm going to go ahead and pick something that fits what I believe. But we have in our own churches people who try to squeeze worldliness into their religion. Religion tells you how you're going to live who you are, what you're meant to do, and where you're going to go in life. It sustains you through the tough times. Anybody say amen to that? Anybody ever been through a tough time? You're about to have a surgery. You got a diagnosis. I went to the hospital the other day. He said, Chaplain, I got a diagnosis of cancer. I didn't expect it. I don't know what to do. I'm still processing it. I asked him, I said, where's God in that for you, brother? Religion helps you deal with the question of the shortness of life. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be a Jew? For Mordecai, in this context, this was a radical time in history for them. Everything was exaggerated for them. And so Mordecai had to make a radical decision and make a stand. The position of the Jews were in a precarious situation. Their livelihood and life itself was at risk. But what does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist today? If I were to ask any of our teenagers here today, would they be able to answer that question? What does it mean? And I'm sure being here, uh, being taught and being preached to and going to Sabbath school and church school, you could answer the question. But there are some churches that they wouldn't be able to answer. What does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist? It means to honor God's commandments, including the fourth commandment. Amen. It means keeping the Sabbath holy. Davis, I remember growing up where you couldn't go to the beach 
on the Sabbath. You couldn't play soccer and uh, a, a volleyball on the Sabbath. Of course, we've kind of grown and understood that the Sabbath is a memorial of God's creation. What better place to be than out in nature? Amen. COVID taught us that. Yeah, well, Pastor, we can have church on the lawn. Yes. <laughs> God made the lawn. The Sabbath is a memorial of God's creation. It means looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. We are not a cult. We believe in Jesus Christ and his second coming. Are there any Adventists today that still carry a track in their purse? I know there's somebody in here. <laughs> any Adventists that pull up to a light, instead of giving them a dollar, we give them a track. This will change your life, brother, better than a McDonald's burger. We used to do that. We used to carry tracks. Y'all, you remember that? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Being a Seventh-day Adventist means believing in the third angel's message. There were three angels that flew and gave a warning message to a dying world. The everlasting gospel, this gospel that shall be preached in all the world will never get old. It will never run out no matter who's in office, no matter what administration, no matter what new theology comes. There are still three angels. By the way, God is using angels right now that's holding back the winds of strife so that we have another chance. Praise the Lord. He is waiting for us to get it together and to get back within the boundaries because of our religion, because of what he, what he taught us. Listen, I preached a sermon last week uh, from the book Habakkuk. I want you to know there was a time where the Israelites lost the holy book. They started living and doing what everybody else was doing, and King Josiah found the lost book, and when he found the lost book as a young man, he was startled and afraid when he began to read the blessings and curses that would fall on God's people if they did not do right. We've forgotten the book. We've lost the book, and somehow we have lost our way. Not Crown Point. I'm talking about everybody else. You, you, I know like you, me thinking, somebody else needs to be here to hear this message. They lost the book, but when he found the book, he called everybody back to repentance. And guess what? They did repent and they did come back. But the spirit of prophecy tells us that when they came back, it, we discovered that they only had a formal transformation. It was only on the surface. Friends of mine, we have to have beliefs that will stand in the time of testing, in the time of trouble, in the time of difficulty. What do we believe as Seventh-day Adventists? We believe in the health message. Listen to me very carefully. And this is important because the rest of the world have seemed to captured what we've been teaching and what we've been given, the gift that we've been given, the health message. The rest of the world are becoming vegan and the rest of the world is becoming vegetarian. The rest of the world are making millions off of vegetarian food. I was asking, I was like, what happened to Loma Linda and Worthington? They developed some great things, but they stopped developing. And now they're coming out with new Vegemite. And now these people who came out with new Vegemite are billionaires. This was a message that God gave to us for us to be enriched with our religion, with our message. Oh, yeah, that's right. The health message is the right arm of the gospel. That means we ought to be leading the world in this. But what has happened? Every year we go down to Florida. We like Florida. Get tired of the snow. This past year was cold. Woo. And I, I was just praying in my spirit. I said, Lord, if you get me through this last winter, whoo. So we got on a plane and said, let's get to Florida, baby. Let's get down to some heat. And we got down there and, you know, all of Florida has um, these hospitals, Advent Hospital. 
Adventist-run hospital and friends that we have down there work in the hospital system. The Advent message has the health message. We have the education message. We have the schools. That's why our schools should be number one, crown point, the first. People ought to be packing this school out. We tried to start a school over in, 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 in Gary, Indiana. It ought to be number one. Believe in Christian education. Believe in the health message. Believe in living healthily. I look at some of my friends. I'm glad I'm still in the military because we have to be fit. And I always tell people, I said, listen, you know, if the military has standards and the military has rules and the military has boundaries, why can't the church keep up the standards? Sanctuary in heaven, the investigative judgment, the spirit of prophecy. There is an attack on the spirit of prophecy today. If you listen to some things that are online, it can discourage you. But the only way that you can keep from being discouraged is to stay in the book. Stay in the book. The seal of God and the mark of the beast is real. The national, national Sunday law, that's being attacked too, whether it's true or not. Let me tell you something. There are Sunday blue laws that are still on the books. And while we as Seventh-day Adventists have religious liberty leaders in Washington that are pushing back on the, the desire to encroach upon religious liberty. Religious liberty is already being attacked. There are young people that are wanting to read their Bibles in public school and teachers are taking their Bibles away at recess. It's happening, go ahead and Google it. Go ahead and Google it if you want to, but notice this, the First Amendment to the Constitution has the free, emphasizes the free exercise of all religion. And let me tell you this. The Sunday blue laws have been uh, sustained by the Supreme Court because they believe it is the free exercise of religion. So if you believe that it's not going to happen, it is already in bed within the foundation and the framework of our country doesn't necessarily mean that it is not going to happen. It has been supported and sustained by the Supreme Court Sunday Blue Laws. The three angels' message of Revelation 14. But can we take things too far as Adventists? Can we take things too far? Sure. And I have to say this because you guys know it's true. For some reason, people may join our church because they are nuts. Yeah, N nuts, N-U-T-S, like the bag with, without the M&Ms. And some of them may become fanatics after they join. You all see them. It happens. But I want you to know if we stay in the word, thus saith the Lord, the Bible, sola scriptura, if we stay close to the truth of the word, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. There is no new group that's forming. There is no new developments that's happening. God has given us enough of truth that we need to take us to the second coming. You got folks that started as Seventh-day Adventists that are running around preaching some other gospel. The Bible says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And then the end shall come. It didn't say a new gospel. It said this gospel from the book. We need to get back to the book. Mordecai knew his religion and he knew his boundaries. I got to tell you something, and maybe you knew this. But in my study, I discovered something very interesting about what was happening in the context and understanding why Mordecai made the decision that he made with Haman. Listen to this. Haman in the Bible is introduced as the Agagite, an intentional reference to the tension between the Israelites and the Am Amalekites. This enemy stems from the time, this enmity stems from the time of the Exodus when Israel fought with Amalek 
in the wilderness. Exodus 17, 15 foretells that the Lord would be at war with them from generation to generation. Do you understand? There's enmity and a war going on from generation to generation. Now, Balaam's oracle of Numbers chapter 24, verse 7 predicts that the Israelite king would be greater than Agag. Are you listening to me? The ancient feud between the Israelites and the Amalekites is reported in 1 Samuel 15. Agag was king of the Amalekites. Are you listening? Saul, the Benjaminite, Son of Kish was directed to destroy and totally wipe out the Amalekites, but failed to do so even though he won the war. He took Agag prisoner, as you know, but Samuel the prophet confronted Saul and cursed him for not compelling and completing God's task. Samuel cut Agag. Did you hear that? Samuel. Who was Samuel? The prophet, the preacher, the preacher. Oh, boy. The preacher had some big assignments. Samuel cut Agag to pieces and Saul's downfall began. Such a military conquest of Agag and his army is part of Israel's tradition which stands behind the scenes of the book of Esther. Listen to me together with this information that Mordecai, watch this, was a Benjaminite. Benjamite. Mordecai was a Benjamite like Saul, uh, like, like Saul, and a descendant of Kish. This mention of Haman as an Agagite gives further understanding why Mordecai resisted this command. Mordecai knew the history of his religion. Mordecai knew the history of his church. Mordecai knew that there was enmity between those wicked people and God commanded there would be a, a division and there would be a battle from generation to generation that's why Mordecai refused to bow to the enemy of God ladies and gentlemen we cannot forget the history of the church we cannot forget the book we cannot forget our beliefs or we will end up bowing to those who we are at war with are you all not hearing me <laughs> I got to get to the whole point of the matter. Revelation chapter 12, and I guess I need to wrap this blessing up. It says this, and the dragon, listen, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. I got to ask you a question, friends of mine. Are you a part of the remnant church? If you are a part of the remnant church, then you cannot forget that we are at war. We are in battle. The battle lines have been drawn, and there can be no compromise with the enemy. Mordecai took his stand and said, I will not bow down. I refuse to bow down. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, you will not win friends when you refuse to go along to get along. Yeah, you will have enemies, and then you will have people that's after you. Ask Daniel. Ask Mordecai. But I want you to know God takes care of his people. Amen. I'm going to have to come back and do a part two. I don't want to wear you out. I'll be like, man, this guy preaches long. I asked the pastor. I said, pastor, how long do I have? He said, well, we do about 30 to 45 minutes. I said, he means 25. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> James chapter 5, the Bible tells us, listen, let me say real quick, you know, what we've done is we've substituted the spirit of God for science. And so we've, we've moved away from the spirit and how God wants to bless his church and how he wants to move in his church. And so instead of calling on James chapter 5, is there any sick among you? Let's call for the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And I'm not against science. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying a substitute for science 
a, a substitute for the spirit, when you substitute materialism or you substitute science or you substitute anything for the word of God, we start to lose the gifts that God has given us to use in our church. We start to lose a sense of the power. We start to lose a sense of the miracles. We start to lose a sense of the things that God has given his church, and we lose that calling and that centralness of the power of God's message. We start looking for peace and prosperity and materialism, and we start looking at what more we can get. But I'm a, I'm a firm believer, and I discovered that you can't take any of this stuff with you. And I began, and my wife knows I've been trying to eliminate stuff out of my life and put things away and get rid and throw out and throw out garbage because, you know, when your time runs out, you can't take none of that stuff with you. The Egyptians tried, and we discovered that when we dug up what they tried to do, it's still there, still in the ground. The archaeologists found all their stuff in the ground. It's still there. They couldn't take it wherever they thought they were going. Friends of mine. The only thing that we could take with us is our conviction, is our beliefs. Pure religion and undefiled before God and his Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, to keep himself unspotted from the world. Real quick, let me close here with this. I want to share three things with you that can help you. As I said, I got more to share, but I'm going to close out here with these three things. How can we live without compromise? You want to know. I want to know. The first thing we can do to live without compromise, friends and Bible believers and Christians and Adventists, number one is know what's really important. You got to know what's really important. Keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> we get distracted by so much. I've had to turn off the news and everything that was going on the last couple years have been ridiculous. Anybody else got stressed out and tired? That's probably why we all got COVID. Everybody got burned out and everybody got a cold all over the world. Everybody got burned out and became vulnerable health-wise. We've got to know what's really important. Let the major things stay the major things and not major in minors. There's a man right now at Oakwood College. He lived to be, he's, he's 105 years old. And I can tell you one thing about Dr. Rogers. If you ask me, what do you know about Dr. Rogers? I could say this, Dr. Rogers always had a smile on his face. And I text that to a friend. He said, you know what, Phil? He said, stress is one of the number one things that'll kill you quick. We got to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is the love of God constraineth us. The love of Jesus in our heart will make you smile. Come on, folks, smile. Let me see a smile on your face. There you go. Yeah, you can smile when you can't say a word. Keep the main thing, the main thing. What's the main thing? Men of Galilee said, why do you stand? They said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back again in the same way you will see him. The main thing is Jesus is coming again. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Number two, don't be afraid to stand out. What do you mean, pastor? Yeah, don't be afraid to stand out, young person. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you are a light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Real quick, uh, as I was in the medical brigade in one of my circulations in the military and had to work at this hospital, do some time in the hospital, I was working pre-surgery and I went to one of the operating rooms and usually before surgery it's pretty quick and you got to move out of the way because there's a lot of medical positions and things are going on before the surgery. And it's common knowledge that the surgeons will come in and sometimes they'll just kind of walk over people. And I'm not against surgeons, Pastor Shepard. I love the surgeons. Take good care of us. Love you, Doc. <laughs> but this one particular day, I think the surgeon just had a – it was a Monday. He was probably – he didn't get enough rest, and he probably had a bad day, and I was in the room uh, – beginning my therapeutic relationship with the patient and uh he, he said hey uh you mind if i interrupt you right now and i said I, I i normally don't mind but i'm in a special place and 
I know what time it is. It's time for the surgery in about five minutes, but if you would just give me a minute, I'll be done. And he says, well, hey, wait a minute, in front of the patient. The surgeons are here for me. They came to have surgery. And I said, yes, sir, I understand that, but we believe in total health, and total health involves them having an opportunity to ameliorate their psychological and spiritual suffering. He's about to be put to sleep. And he doesn't know if he's going to wake up. And he's got to have a question answered before he goes down. What will happen to me if I die today? He said, well, okay. <laughs> and I asked, I asked the, the patient that moment, I said, hey, listen. I said, do you have any spiritual needs? He said, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not after all of that. As a matter of fact, show me the door. I'm out of here. The surgeon is mad. <laughs> what happened there, I'm talking about standing out. The nurses and the other medical staff said, Chaplain, we saw there was a little commotion. What happened in there? And I said, hey, I told them what happened. They said, listen, we're, we're proud of you, how you handled it. And we're glad somebody stood up because we're getting walked over all the time. It only took you, the chaplain, the man of God who had the cross of Jesus, who walked in there and told the surgeon what to do. I said, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do, but we have to take a stand and be a light and not be afraid to call truth to power. Somebody say amen. How do we live without compromise? Finally, number three, ask the question, what is best practices? For the Adventist church today. You've got to ask the question. Romans chapter 12 verse 2. And here it is. In our final message of today. And be not conformed. To this world. But be transformed by the renewing. Of your mind. That ye may prove. What is that good. And acceptable. And perfect will. Of God. Friends of mine, we've got to ask, what is the best practice for Adventists? You are part of the remnant church, God's commandment-keeping people. It defines you. It refines you. It sets a boundary around you of what you can do and what you can't do. A follower of Jesus Christ, one who is looking forward to the second coming with the three angels' message. Oh, by the way, Revelation 18, the loud cry, come out of her, my people. Don't be conformed to this world. There is a call for God's people today to live without compromise. And those people who live without compromise will stand out. You will be a light in darkness because you will look different than everybody else. And by the way, be prepared. You will draw people that are against you, but you will also draw people that are for you. As a matter of fact, God is on your side. Somebody ought to say amen. The angels that excel in strength are on your side. And when you get weak, ask God. He will open your eyes and show you. Look to the hills and see the angels that excel in strength that are fighting on your behalf. Somebody ought to say amen. Mordecai didn't bow because of his beliefs. The question is today, do you, listen to me carefully, have beliefs that are strong enough that will stand against the tide of this world? There's going to have to be a point where you decide, I will be uncompromising on the word of God. I can't marry you. I love you, but I can't marry you because of my religion. Fourth grade, I can't come to the party. It's on the Sabbath hours. I can't be in the Huckleberry Finn play. I was the pastor in the Huckleberry Finn play in the fourth grade in a public school in Champaign, Illinois, and I couldn't do it because it was on the edges of the Sabbath. You have got to take a stand. Are you willing to take a stand? Let us pray. Father God, today, it is my prayer that we take a stand 
without compromise, Lord, that we will stand on the truth of the word. And we will hold firmly to what we believe and we will get back to the study and ask the question, what are the best practices of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today? How can we love people in our beliefs and love people to God as God is seeking to bring people to him as well? That we may stand more truly and more holy on his holy word. Amen.